Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 188 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Mighty Well, an interview with Emily Levy. My name is Richard Johannesson. And I'm Matt Sabatello. Matt, this was a fascinating episode. We were interviewing a visionary, and this is a young woman and her close friends, now her husband and her roommate from college, who put together their energies and they created Mighty Well. Mighty Well is the Spanx of medical wearables. This is the Sarah Blakely of medical wearables, and she has created or at least manifested adaptive fashion. And it was just an absolute pleasure to interview this young woman. And Rich, there were so many powerful parts of this podcast interview. Emily talked to us about the two missing components through her healing journey. And when she finally learned these two pieces in her healing journey, it helped her get past that hurdle. Second, Emily really formed a community that embraces all members of the lawn community and makes us feel like we have a home where we can feel safe and communicate and help each other. So Matt, it's really a pleasure for us to introduce to the Tick Bootcamp community, Emily Levy, the visionary, the founder of Mighty Well, and the creator of Adaptive Fashion. Hey, Emily, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Tick Boot Camp, for having me. I've been listening for a while now, and it's exciting for me to be able to share my journey with your community. And we're really excited to have you share your community, your your journey with our community as well. And so, Emily, let's uh, get to it. Give us uh, first uh, a sense of where you live. Sure. Um, right now, I live in Providence, Rhode Island. I've moved around quite a bit, but Rhode Island has really always been home base for me. So you're an East Coast gal. Yes, yes, definitely. Deep roots here. So talk to us about your moving around. Where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? And uh, where are all the places you moved around to? <laughs> OK, um, I, my family lived in Rhode Island, but I was born in Boston. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was seven. And my mom and I moved to Brookline, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. Um, my dad's lived in Narragansett, Rhode Island my whole life. So that's always kind of been where I've come back to. Um, from there in fifth grade, I went to New Jersey um, for about two and a half years. Uh, then came back to Rhode Island. I grew up actually on an island that didn't have a red light <laughs> um, called Jamestown. And then I went to college at Babson College, which is in Wellesley, Massachusetts, another suburb of Boston. Um, spent some time living in San Francisco, spent some time living in Haifa, Israel, um, then went to New York City for a few years, back to Providence, back to New York, and now um, I think we're going to settle in Rhode Island. Mighty Wells headquarters is here. So for the most part, you have been an East Coast gal and you've been living in the line belt. Uh, yes, and I had no idea until I got sick. And crazy enough, like Jamestown, uh, our local town paper that posted that one in five people in our town had tick-borne illness. And I remember like seeing like signs all around town, like check for ticks, check for ticks. But, you know, it, it really, um, did the message didn't get through. <laughs> no. Well, and, and, and we're going to spend some time talking about that after we get more of a context for you. Uh, but Talk to us about your, your education. What was your education like during your childhood? And what kind of experiences did you have athletically and socially? And, and what kind of enrichment uh, did you have uh, growing up? Sure. Um, so definitely a complicated modern family. Um, but I, I do always consider Rhode Island to be home. Um, I always like to tell people that I actually started off in Waldorf school. Um, which is a school system that's very much based in like imagination, play, creativity, going outside and learning at your own pace. Um, that really set a foundation for me of like thinking outside the box and just knowing it's like okay to be a little bit different or like crunchy granola, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I went to public school until high school, I mean until college, where um, I got a scholarship to bounce in college uh, for women's entrepreneurial leadership. And that really, um, you know, set the course of, you know, my, the chapters of my adult life. Um, but when I was in high school, call in elementary school, um, in middle school, I played three sports. I was a captain of my field hockey team. I was the captain of my JV lacrosse team. Um, spent hours at the gym after school. Um, my dad is one of the original East Coast surfers, cold water surfers. So I grew up. 
uh, you know, being in surf competitions as a kid um, and, you know, just really being like a child of the beach and the water. And I found that really healing, you know, throughout my lifetime and continue to return to that. Um, but I would say like, you know, for as crazy as my childhood was, you know, really, um, I was very fortunate to have a great um, public school education. And then um, it really put me on the course of this entrepreneurial leadership path, you know, growing up. Um, always extremely independent, really, that was, you know, a foundation, I would say, of growing up. And I think being a child of divorce, you know, just having to be, you know, super organized with my things and understanding how to move through different social circles and scenes, um, almost like a chameleon. So let's talk about your college experience for a moment. You, uh, you were, um, you were, awarded a women's entrepreneurial scholarship. Talk to us about why you are attracted to uh, entrepreneurship and why you think the entrepreneurial model, or at least why you were taught the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. model may be the best model for social change. Yes, I absolutely believe um, business and entrepreneurship is really how we're gonna make tangible change across the world and across cultures. Um, I had no idea what the meaning of entrepreneurship was until I found Babson. I didn't know that my family were entrepreneurs. Um, for years, my dad was the only full-time uh, surfboard shaper on the East Coast. And, you know, we'd have people knocking on the door to pick up their surfboard and I'd be like, hello, you know, I'd be customer service basically at like 10 years old. Um, so once I heard about Babson and that like entrepreneurship was a thing that you could actually study, um, I knew that I wanted a hands-on education. I knew that I wanted um, small classes. Um, I knew that I wanted to eventually have my own business, but I, I honestly thought it'd be much, much later in my life. Um, and of course, having you know a financial scholarship is always <laughs> really helpful. And um, with it being like an hour and a half from my home and having much younger siblings than me, it just it really felt like the right fit. So let's talk more specifically about entrepreneurship itself. I want to get to the mm -hmm. female entrepreneurship element in a minute, but let's talk about entrepreneurship and social change. So mm -hmm. I understand why you were attracted to it and how you had these, these childhood experiences that led you there. I, I also understand that having a scholarship is a wonderful thing. Now, certainly as a parent of four daughters, I always <laughs> yeah. enjoyed whatever scholarships were available. But let's focus now on entrepreneurship and social change because you yeah. are clearly someone who is interested in social change. And I want, I want you to explain to us what you were taught at least before you became an entrepreneur, why entrepreneurship is the best vehicle for social change. Mm. Sure. Um... I really learned this, this model called entrepreneurial thought in action, ET and day. Um, it's like the term the school kind of coined. Um, but just the thought of like, you have to take action in order to create change and you can use business to create social change was really uh, a big foundation of my education. Um, and we have, you know, so many, um, social entrepreneurs come in and talk to us about how you know they transform their own business either to be more environmentally friendly or to employ people who typically wouldn't have access to these type of jobs just really resonated um, with me and as i started to learn that this was like a global shift in the way that people were doing business and that you could do good um really was just was very attractive to me and I think, you know, leaning into the female entrepreneurship lens, women tend to be more compassionate. They tend to, you know, look at more than just the balance sheet. You know, they tend to care more about what happens to their employees when they go home. Um, and I think for me, that was as I started to, you know, become sicker that I was like, okay, like this is my why. And it, it really created that foundation of like, why am I doing this? Why am I getting out of bed when I feel like crap, you know? And it was to make change because I didn't want other people feeling the way I did. All right, so now let's step back and look at the macro of your education uh, from your childhood all the way through college. 
Mm-hmm. Now, you did share with us a moment ago that you were generally aware of ticks and tick diseases because of signs and other information that was put out either by governments or by private institutions that were at least posting signage. Other mm-hmm. than the sign information that you had gathered or the information from the signs that you had gathered, what else did you know about ticks and tick diseases from this vast and enriching ex, uh, educational experience you had from your childhood all the way through college? Sure. Um, honestly, nothing. It's funny because my, one of my mom's first cousins had um, chronic Lyme, neurological Lyme since like the 80s. And I always just knew I was like my cousin who was sick um, and you know that she was a little different from everyone else. But honestly, um, n- nothing. <laughs> nothing yet you'd see these signs but i think the typical line um symptoms you know bullseye rash all that just were not the boxes i was checking at the time emily you were you're an outdoorsy gal at least by mm-hmm. culture your dad your mom yes. uh you know were outdoorsy people you were an athlete um you know you were a surfer. So you were outdoors all the time. Did you have any information that allowed you to protect yourself from coming in contact with ticks? And if you did come in contact with ticks to prevent yourself from getting chronically ill? Unfortunately, Rich, no. And that is one of the biggest things that um, I wish was was more available, especially, um, you know, being that little girl who just was like, what is wrong with me? So there were some public health campaigns in the communities mm-hmm. where you lived. And mm-hmm. uh, you actually lived in a community where one in five people were chronically ill, yet there was some something lacking between the awareness process and the action that was necessary to keep you healthy. Yes, and I think that's because they focus really on acute Lyme disease. So now let's let's talk about how your symptoms developed. When did you first start to see symptoms of what you now know to be uh, your Lyme disease? Sure. Um, It's funny because until like this past year, I had actually blocked out a lot of the memories. And one of the very, very vivid memories that keeps coming back to me is I was six years old and I had maybe just gone to the beach or I had come back from Waldorf summer camp, which was outside on a farm. And my mom had found an engorged um, tick in my hair, like while she was, you know, washing my hair. But I think my mom just took it out and she didn't do anything with it. Um, And now looking back, you know, I I had strep throats all the time. I was getting urinary tract infections at a very young age. Um, And I didn't consider myself a chronically ill kid. But now looking back, I'm like, okay, like you know, getting your adenoids out in fifth grade because you have all this sinus stuff going on, I now know is probably symptoms of, you know, being bit very early. Um, However, when I was in seventh grade, we were living in New Jersey at the time, you know, one of the selling features of the house was that you would see deer (laughs) outside of your, your main window. Um, I became very, very ill. I wasn't able to finish the last month of seventh grade. And I really consider my chronic illness journey to have begun um, when I was probably about 12 years old living in New Jersey. So you had this sort of restricted or limited immune system up until you were in seventh grade. And then at seventh, when you were in seventh grade, you crashed. Crash, crash, crash. Um, That summer really was just like a blur of, of me not being able to do anything. I lost about 20 pounds. I was light sensitive, sound sensitive. You know, I couldn't surf anymore. Um, And I think the the subtle levels of depression started to creep in then too. So talk to us about how your Lyme disease symptoms between the age of six and seventh grade impacted your capacity to pursue your educational and your athletic pursuits. Um, so you're saying like six years old to seventh grade? Yeah, before you crashed. Honestly, I, I don't really remember like that being a huge part of it. You know, I still, I played soccer, was still, you know, going surfing with my dad. Um, I, I would say I could do all those things. It was more so like after that huge crash in seventh grade, 
um, which I now believe is because mono is going around the school and like I, I definitely got Epstein-Barr virus in seventh grade. Um, something about like, I don't know if the Epstein-Barr exacerbated the Lyme or I got bit again. And, you know, part of me thinks I was bit again because I found a Babesia type rash on my leg and we took that to the pediatrician and she was like, oh, maybe it's eczema, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say it really didn't affect me until seventh grade. Um, and I was even, you know, I, I was able to play sports in high school, but it was very painful and I did not feel like I was believed. So talk to us about the pain that you were feeling and the impact that the pain was having on your capacity to be a, a three sport athlete. Sure. Um, in high school, field hockey was, you know, my life. That's like my friend group, um, you know, where I really like saw my identity at the time. Um, but after probably like a year of playing um, extreme hip, knee, joint pain, migrating pain, uh, neck pain, you know, swelling of the lymph and the glands. And as much as like I love my coach, they were like, either you sit down or you play. So I played through the pain and, you know, I love my mother to death, but her mentality was like, just walk it off, just walk it off. You know, she went to college um, on a track scholarship. So she, and, and my dad being such an athlete, you know, he used to put super glue in his cuts, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, keep going or shut, sit down or shut up. Um, and now realizing just like how damaging that was, um, but they didn't know better. And um, by my senior year, I, I had to, <laughs> I actually had to quit playing lacrosse after my sophomore year and just to just focus on like my true passion um, of field hockey. But I, my senior year, I, I was hardly able to play. Um, you know, I used to run for fun and I now have dreams of running again. So it's a slow, slow, slow crawl. <laughs> So Emily, talk to us about um, about this uh, this concept of so sucking it up. We've we've actually had yeah. folks from other cultures on the West Coast talk about cowboying up, but there is sort of this mentality that we you know we sometimes parent our children with, where you need to suck it up, you need to tough you need to tough it out. Talk to us about how your parents, although good people and wanting you to be successful, perhaps may have created a mindset that could have exacerbated your illness. Sure. And Rich, honestly, this is something I am still in therapy over. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, their generation as well, like their parents didn't really listen to them. You know, they were only sick if they need to go, they, you know, they only went to doctors if it was like the emergency room or a broken arm. So I think that concept of like going to um, the doctor was also just not really like a thing in my family. Um, my mom is also ahead of the curve when it comes to like uh, healthy eating and naturopathic medicine. Like I was doing all that in the nineties, you know, like I joke that my mom gave me soy milk, you know, <laughs> from like the time I was five years old. Um, so I think that was a piece of it. Um, in addition, uh, my dad had lost his business, um, in right after nine 11 and, you know, access to healthcare was also a challenge for our family financially at times, um, at least in one household. So yeah, I think that's where some of this deep um, sense of just, just walk it off really came from. So what impact did that concept of walking it off for toughing it out have on your ability to read the signals that your body was sending to you when you were young mm. and what impact did that have on you as you were growing older? That's a great question. I think that when I was a key, like very, very sick, you know, in the seventh grade um, and, you know, they, I think my mom was told it was mono. At one point she was told it, it was, pro it could be leukemia, um, which was pretty scary. So I think in that time period, you know, like seventh to eighth grade, people really like treated me like, okay, like she needs to go slow. Like she has mono people, people know what the kissing disease is, you know? Um, but it was more so once I kind of got back to the place where my grades were good in school, I could play field hockey. I was socially doing very well. Um, you know, I would really complain about like neck pain, shoulder pain, joint pain, but it wasn't, um, I think just because honestly, I was socially functioning so well, people didn't take it seriously. But I'm asking you more about you 
and the signals mm -hmm. you were receiving, not how people were treating you. Sure. We'll get to that in a minute. Because what, one of the things we've learned from our podcast is that many people who are suffering from chronic illnesses and specifically chronic Lyme disease have essentially been taught to ignore the signals that their body is sending to them. One of our guests actually told us that she had to had to Google the emotion wheel because she hadn't been allowed to feel emotions for so long. She didn't know what they were, and she had to learn how to read emotions so that she could use those signals to determine whether or not she was wisely mm -hmm. treating her illness or not. So talk to us about yeah. not how other people were were impacting you i want to know how it impacted your ability to read your own signals on your healing journey that's a great question i've actually never been asked that before um i knew something was wrong probably since the time i was about 15 16. um and i feel like when I would tell people it was invalidated at times. So that made me question, you're like, oh, maybe my neck is just stiff because I'm like typing term papers, you know, or maybe I'm just depressed because like my, my boyfriend at 16 years old, like broke up with me, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think digging down into like, why am I feeling this way was never really something I even considered. I just knew something was wrong. And I didn't feel like I had the support system um, to really do anything about it. I think a lot of it as well was blamed on anxiety and depression. And now looking back, it's like, okay, those are like surface level symptoms of something way, way deeper. So Emily, we, we focus on external forces. We, we focus on intimate forces and we focus on our own mind in this journey that we that we go through with people. And let's talk about the external forces first, right? What doctors did you see? You did share with us at, at, at least in, in, in part of your parental experience, there may have been some limited access to healthcare, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure you did have contact with doctors between mm -hmm. the age you were, the age of six and the time that you became chronically ill. How many doctors did you see? And, um, and uh, how did they treat you when you, were, when you were giving your doctors the outline of the various uh, Lyme disease mm. symptoms that you were sharing? Sure. Well, I can't count how many doctors I've been to um, or how many medical bills I've paid um, for people who dismissed me. But I keep coming back to my pediatrician when I was in seventh grade. Um, I distinctly remember showing her all the little uh, red dots on my legs, showing her the stretch marks, you know, you know, when she saw my stretch mark, she's like, okay, like, how's her diet? What's her BMI? You know, those typical questions like, oh, she's growing really quickly. You know, she has growing pains. Um, but the little red dots, you know, eczema. Um, but then when I came back like a few months later when I had really crashed, I remember for the first time ever feeling like uh, a medical mystery because they called in all of these med students, I guess, to like examine me, you know, I was a little girl and they were all like poking and prodding and asking questions and talking about me, but not to me. And, you know, even though I was in seventh grade, like I just didn't feel part of that journey at the time. And I was just so freaking sick. Um, but then later, um, you know, once I started to see Lyme literate doctors, I, which I didn't even know was like a thing. Um, I did feel quite often still like a name on a chart and that kind of medical mystery. Um, and I think that does a lot to anyone, but especially a young woman. Um, well, talk to us about what it did to you and specifically, did it cause you to doubt whether or not you were sick? Um, deep down, I always knew I was sick. I started to doubt more so the medical system. Okay. Well, were there any other adults in your life prior mm -hmm. to your diagnosis that you would come in contact with, whether they be teachers or school nurses or any mm -hmm. other professionals that had the responsibility of, of supporting you that you shared your health challenges with who didn't validate the information mm -hmm. you were given to them? I'm just thinking back to a really scary experience when I was in high school. Um, I had two episodes where um, like I passed out 
in school and the emergency, you know, EMTs needed to come and go to the hospital. Um, and I think I, uh, definitely some frustration at like the school system and, and my teachers and my coaches for not realizing that like, you know, going from so functional to like passing out in math class, you know, and that I think as a woman just being blamed on like, you know anxiety depression does she have an eating disorder that was like a big topic of conversation at one point let me just state i love food <laughs> um so definitely that frustration of like why didn't my own school system my own teachers coaches um notice anything i did i have one amazing teacher who had actually um you know been going through breast cancer who did realize kind of some of the more emotional issues that was going on or attached to my health and she took me under her wing but on a whole i i'm learning to kind of forgive these people so now let's talk about the people in your intimate circle you did share with us that your your parents weren't always um as validating as we'd want them to be although they were well intentioned they were mm -hmm. they were the kind of parents that told you to you know wipe it off wipe the dirt off uh and uh you know just go forward with the bruised knee but what other people in your intimate circle did you share that you have in these challenges with meaning friends boyfriends or girlfriends mm -hmm um uh grandparents what other intimate people did you have contact with who may or may not have given you the support that you needed at the time sure um so i'm fast forwarding now to my college experience um you know my school ended up i guess i got diagnosed at 19 after my freshman year so so fast forwarding to that time period um, I had just started dating uh, Yusuf, my now husband and Mighty Well co-founder. And I remember like telling him like, I'm gonna be very sick. Like you can leave, <laughs> it's okay. Like here's the door, um, but he didn't go anywhere. And if anything, like um, my love for him just grew. Because well, why, did of the way you think he did... he, why did you think he was going to be interested in leaving it? Did that happen to you before either with people mm. that you had social relationships with or intimate relationships with? That's a good question. I hadn't thought of it that way. I think part of it is just seeing how like people had kind of dismissed me like, oh, there's Emily complaining again, you know, oh, she's got a bad knee. Grandma's got a bad knee too. You know, I, I honestly, like as much as I love my extended family, um, they also had the mentality of like, kind of just walk it off. Um, so I think just seeing as well in our society, how disabled and chronically ill people are treated especially ones that have invisible illness i just i think in the back of my mind just thought like my uncle i love my uncle to death but he was like who'd want to be with you was like literally what he said and i was like oh like i guess he does i don't, I don't know um yeah like i guess the notion in our society of like who would want to love a disabled person um was really i think the message society and my own family was sending to me and was the signal that you were receiving that you had to earn love rather than that you were lovable without having to earn it? Uh, after years of therapy, yes. <laughs> um, you know, learning that I, th I think too, as well in my entrepreneurial journey, why I did so many of these pitch competitions, you know, was, was the external approval. And I think um, that definitely played a role into it. Yeah, which I didn't even know was a thing until recently. So tell us about uh, your diagnostic journey and, and how you were diagnosed and who diagnosed you finally with Lyme disease. Sure. Um, so that begins a whole new chapter. Um, after my freshman year at Babson, um, the previous summer, my little brother, who's 10 years younger, uh, we found a tick on him from our yard, classic bullseye symptoms. Um, you know, my mom got to take him to a Lyme literate um, pediatrician. So she, that's how she started to learn about Lyme. And she, you know, she had previously been taking me all my freshman year to like um, a thyroid doctor, like endocrinologist, you know, psychologist. Um, but it wasn't until I think my mom deepened her knowledge that she finally got me into seeing a Lyme literate nurse practitioner. Um, Susan Newber at the Lyme Center of New England here in Rhode Island. Um, and that's when Susan, you know, did the Igenix testing, did the Stony Brook testing, did all my labs. And she sat us down. She's like, you know, Emily is very sick. 
um, but in the back of my mind, and I think because that childhood mentality of like, oh, I'm fine, you know, I was very determined to like not make this my whole life. Um, but that's, you know, I, I tried the oral antibiotics. I was throwing up, you know, I'd leave class basically to like go puke. Um, and just felt like neurologically I was severely declining. You know, I went from getting straight A's in high school to like a D's and C's in college. And at first we blamed that on like, oh, the college transition is hard. But like, no, literally, like I'd walk out of class and I have no idea like what that professor just said. Um, so I did IV antibiotics with a pick line uh, for six months. And uh, that was my sophomore year in college. I was about 20 years old. Um, and I felt honestly like the pick line almost like validated what I was going through because people could physically see that um, medical device, you know, it being in the arm and the, the tubing going all the way to the heart and just starting to explain to people, you know, people had a lot more compassion for me. That's what I noticed when I got the medical device, people have more compassion for me. And I was like, holy shit, like this is a bit fucked up, <laughs> you know, um, six months of IV antibiotics, Rocephin, Flagyl what's that yellow paint stuff that's like a thousand dollars a bottle did did all that um and I actually felt good enough to the point where I was like okay I want my pick out um I wanted to go to Israel for the summer to uh intern with a, a high-tech company um and I, I had a really good summer like I, I did well I went hiking again I was interning four days a week you know still still the chronic fatigue but like I literally took one suitcase of medical supplies in one suitcase of, of the clothes I would need for the summer. And, um, you know, I, I'd say really since I was 19, I'm now 27, it's been this like peaks and valleys of me having a really good, maybe a year, six months to, okay, crashing again and up, up and down that roller coaster. Um, I had a second pick line uh, about two years after I came back from Israel. Uh, right after college, I started crashing again. And I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just yeah. want to back up a little bit to to f go back to the beginning of your treatment sure. journey. So, you mentioned in the beginning you were a freshman in college and you took oral antibiotics, but they didn't work too well. How long were you on the oral antibiotics for before you went to the IV antibiotics? About six months. And did you did you notice any sort of improvement from the orals? No. No. Was it just doxycycline or were you on combination therapy with other antibiotics as well? The first thing she put me on was the yellow paint stuff, which I totally forget what is Mep Mepron. Mepron. Um, you know, it stain all my clothes. Um, yeah, Mepron, you know, it, it's hard to say. And also looking back on this journey, like I had severe acne in high school and I was put on like tetracycline in high school. And I think that's what kind of like kept me at this like baseline. Um, but really like my stomach could not handle the pills and all the supplements, even things like fish oil, you know, couldn't stay down. So what are your thoughts on, we've heard that people who have taken antibiotics for other purposes before getting a diagnosis mentioned they saw symptom relief and then they yes. made the connection once they got diagnosed. We've also heard people say that that's actually hurt them in their healing journey because it wasn't adequate treatment and then it left mm. the line even stronger than it was before. So do you think that it was actually helpful in the long run or just short-term helpful and actually made things worse in the long run for you by getting treated for acne before your Lyme diagnosis? Yeah. You know, Matt, it's really hard to say. Um, I do think it kept things at bay and that's what allowed me to go on and have these, you know, successful things that I was able to do at a young age. And it, it, it led me, you know, to college. So I have to take the outlook that it helped me because it did help me, um, in other areas of my life, you know, most likely it destroyed my gut, <laughs> you know, not going to lie. And that's a big part of my healing right now is, is my gut health. Um, but I think it, it was probably a good thing. So we're back at your freshman year, you're on the oral antibiotics and you mentioned your gut health you think has been destroyed from all these antibiotics. Were you doing anything at the time with your Lyme doctor to address your gut health, your immune system and mm -hmm. any of the other negative side effects that come along with oral antibiotics? Sure. Um, she definitely put me on a very strong like prescription probiotic. So I do remember taking that and just needing to figure out like, okay, you can't take this at the same time on my meds, you know, uh, cleaned up my diet, um, you know, reduced the sugar, gluten, dairy, soy, corn, all of those triggers. Um, 
but I would say those were the major steps I was taking at like 20 years old. Talk to us about diet. So do you think when you started to change your diet based on your Lyme litter doctor's recommendation, did you see an immediate connection between the foods you were eating and the way you were feeling? Absolutely. Um, especially gluten. I later found out that I have celiac, um, which I probably never would have figured out unless, you know, I've done all these, these testings through my Lyme literate doctors and neurologists. Um, so I am grateful for that. I would say like my joint pain significantly reduced, um, you know, found out I have candida. So a lot less bloating, you know, through following like no dairy, no, no gluten protocols. Um, I really tell people that like what goes into your body becomes your body. So it's really critical um, to think about those foods. And Emily, when you started the IV antibiotics, were you still treating with the same Lyme doctor that you found through your mother mm -hmm. and your sibling? Or was this a new doctor that you went to to start the IV antibiotics? Uh, great question. Um, so I did all of my IV treatments with the Lyme Center of New England um, for the first two pick lines. Um, I did see other uh, LLMDs, you know, when I kind of just wanted a second opinion. Um, but I would say, you know, Sue really got me to like a baseline point. Um, you know, I've since moved on from her practice in order to focus on some other autoimmune and gut health challenges and neuro challenges, but, um, I really credit her and especially like hygienics testing for figuring out what was wrong with me. <laughs> it kind of felt like, um, I cried because I was happy I had an answer, but I definitely did not know what that path, you know, I, I thought, oh, six months of this and I'll be back to myself. So I'm going to ask you a really hard and probably impossible question to answer, but sure. so many people reach out all the time saying, I have Lyme, I've tried many different things, I'm considering IV antibiotics. And it's a hard question to answer because there are a lot of things that can go wrong with IV antibiotics, complications, you can have clots, you can have mm -hmm. infections, but there's also a lot of positive benefits to them as well. So looking back in your specific journey, do you think that IV antibiotics were appropriate for your treatment journey or would you have, you know, in hindsight, went a different direction? It's hard to say because you know we just don't know um but i do credit with iv antibiotics for allowing me to live a very normal functioning young adulthood you know i don't think i could have had all of these entrepreneurial achievements without the iv antibiotics no i i i firmly believe that um it also got me very involved with the association for vascular access which is um in the United States, uh, our governing body for setting vascular access protocols. And I, I really, um, just by sharing my Lyme story, they kind of found me. And it's been a huge part of my story is educating people, you know, the pros and cons on vascular access. And I now live with an implanted port. So let's talk more about the IV antibiotics. So you weren't mm -hmm. doing much better with the orals. You went to the IV and you mentioned within six months you were traveling you know, to another country and doing that much better. So how quickly did you see results after starting the IV antibiotics? I'd say by like month four, you know, I started to notice the joint pain being less, maybe me being able to go to a sorority event or two, or, you know, another, at another Shabbat dinner. Um, so I, yeah, I think by like three, four months, I could see that this was worth all of the struggles. And talk to us about some of the struggles that came along with the pick line. I'm sort of foreshadowing here for Rich and you mm -hmm. later when you have your discussion, but such as showering with a pick line in and a lot of the obstacles that come along with living your everyday life while treating Lyme disease with a pick line in your, in your arm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I really felt like people started to believe me when I got my pick line because like why else, you know, most of my friends had an extra fridge in their room for beer and alcohol and mine was for those little infusion pump balls. <laughs> so, you know, um, leaning into that, um, uh, brain fog. What's the question, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> so just talk to us more about the complications that came along with the pick oh, line right. and how it impacted your quality of life from, from, from a, even a, bathing standpoint, from a socialization mm -hmm. standpoint, from a cleanliness standpoint, how did you manage the obstacles that came along with the PIC line? Yes. Um, so with my first PIC, um, and PIC stands for peripherally inserted central catheter. I think a lot of people don't know that. Um, I'd say the number one challenge was dressing and showering. 
And as someone, you know, Babson was a school where you wore a business suit to class, <laughs> you know, you wore a dress to class, you know, sweatpants were not really a thing. Um, so, so having to go and do these business presentations and, and quite often, you know, in front of very important people, I did feel like people were staring at me and they were looking at my arm instead of the words coming out of my mouth. And I think that really was the catalyst to creating the pick perfect and, and starting mighty well. Um, things like showering. Uh, one of our co-founders, Maria Delmar Gomez was actually my um, sweet mate and she would help me shower. So like imagine you know being 20 years old and being like asking your best friend like hey can can you help me take a shower <laughs> you know tried every single pick line cover on the market tried every single shower sleeve you know none of them worked for my more active lifestyle or even things like you know when my little sister would want to like snuggle in bed and watch a movie and, and me having to the anxiety around the tubing i think was like the biggest thing for me and the anxiety around like okay like uh, what if what if this get what if this line gets infected and that's why I started diving deeper into the world of vascular access because it was really a preventative measure in me wanting to keep my body and my health safe um, and little things like you know when you're doing the IV drip and you see the little bubbles and you're like oh my god I could have an air embolism <laughs> you know things like that uh, and a huge challenge of mine especially with the first pick when I didn't really know about all the different supply options was I got contact dermatitis, which is from the dressing and from like when you clean the area, not necessarily letting the alcohol uh, dry well enough. I was having a lot of allergic reactions to the products that were standard, uh, you know, sent from the infusion company. And that also infuriated me. And so that allowed me to dive deeper into what are the alternative products for patients who are chronically ill. You know, it's it's one thing, you know, if you get into a car accident, you're gonna, and you get an infection and it's like four weeks of this. But when you're living with a pick line, my longest was 18 months, you know, that that's a year and a half that's missing out on things. Like I, I had to stop snowboarding, you know, cause what if I fell and I fell on my arm, you know, definitely could not surf was terrified to go to the beach and, and be around sand. So, you know, I think like a lot of people that added layer of like social anxiety really became um, a factor around having vascular access. And the healthier you're getting from the antibiotics, the more you want to do, and you still can't yeah. do those things. So, right. so Emily, I'm just curious. So when you, when you got the pick line out, I think you said you went to Israel, correct? Yes. And you know, talk to us about what your life was like when you went to Israel and what treatment if any, you were still doing at that time and what was going on in your life health wise? Sure. Um, so um, my family is, is very secular. My, my father's family is Jewish. Um, my mother's family culturally is Irish Catholic. Um, and there was just that deep desire for me to understand my roots better. And um, there was a free trip to Israel at 18. And I was like, I'm going, you know, and um, no one in Israel really knew what Lyme disease was. Um, there are a few people who had heard about it, you know, through traveling um, in America, but for the most part, I really had to explain to everyone like what it was, what the symptoms were, how the, how I needed to be um, accommodated. And I feel like that was the first time where I really had to speak up and ask for lifestyle accommodations. Um, you know, for example, asking my internship boss, you know, I might need to go home and take a nap, you know, you're going to see me taking these tinctures, <laughs> you know, um, and at this point, um, my mom also suggested that I started to integrate with Chinese herbal medicine. So I was doing, you know, the pick line protocol, IV antibiotics, but I um, had a lot of supplements, tinctures and things like that, um, that I definitely think helped, but in my case, I don't think could have alone uh, gotten me to a remission level. Um, and, and when I was in Israel, it was almost like I could start to like breathe again in the way that I was like, oh, like I can go out with some friends on a Friday night, but explaining to them like, hey, I can't drink alcohol because my liver looks like that of an alcoholic, <laughs> um, you know, all these drugs, you know, so just those things like learning to like have kombucha at a party um, were, were all those like little lifestyle things that make you kind of feel othered. 
So I just want to clarify, because I think I may have misspoke. You were still on the IV antibiotics in Israel with now Chinese medicine supplementing and a lot of herbs, it sounds like, right? Uh, no, that's just my brain fog. I actually asked Sue to pull my pick so I could go to Israel. Um, and I supplemented that summer with, um, with herbs. Yeah. Do you think that the herbs were responsible for helping you get through and without them, it would have been a much more difficult experience? Looking back, I think they were definitely helping me detox and helping me um, just my body heal and put some of the pieces back together. Um, you know, I, I was able to do things like go hiking, which I hadn't been able to do for years. So I think they were very supportive. So Emily, talk to us about what happened next. It sounds like your health took a, a dip again, and then you had to end up back on a pig line again for more IV antibiotics. So how did that happen? Sure. Um, so now we're fast forwarding to about two years later, 22, about to graduate college. And I just really noticed um, in the last semester of school that my brain fog was coming back. Some of my joint pain was coming back. This whole time I had continued on supplements and went back to um, some oral antibiotics that my body was like now in, able to handle. But again, it was just that intense feeling that like I was slipping backwards yet this was a time period in my life where i felt like my life was like just going to begin um and i had uh, started mighty well which was just named pick perfect our, our first product at the time um and i had these entrepreneurial dreams and i really had to make the decision that um you know i couldn't work a traditional nine to five job um, i had gotten a great job offer in new york city with a very well-known media company um, you know, my parents very much wanted me to go the corporate route, um, but it was this deep sense of I am I am too sick to run around New York City. So that was that was very painful. You know, having to stand up for myself with my new potential employer, telling them like, you know, I know you just hired me and I signed this contract, but um, I, I think I'm going to need a pick line again. So that set off another 18 months of of treatment. Emily, did you start Mighty Well while you were still a senior in college? Or did that start right after when you declined the offer in New York City? So I started um, Mighty Well, which was just pick perfect um, as an idea uh, when I had my first pick line because I was like, this tubing is crazy. I can't sleep. I can't shower. Um, and growing up in a surf shop, I was learning about all these fabric technologies that were coming out for athletes, things that have like fabrics that had antimicrobial properties. So I was prototyping um, through class projects with Maria and Yusuf, um, spent a semester in San Francisco, you know, trying to find factory partners, trying to come up with a business plan. Um, but it was really once I graduated from Babson um, and I had gotten into an accelerator called Mass Challenge, um, which is a very prestigious incubator in Boston that, um, you know, we were like, okay, what can this be? You know, it's not just about pick lines. It's not just about vascular access. It's about people with chronic illnesses and disabilities. One, not really being able to dress and feel normal, but two, like protect their medical devices. Um, and just as I began to become more public with my story, um, you know, I'm sure like tick boot camp, like people just start coming out of the woodwork and start emailing me and like talking to me. And I'd spend so much time on the phone with people that I was like, okay, there, there's something here. So that was, I think, the second layer to it. Like, not only could I not work a corporate job, but secondly, you know, there's something here has legs, even if my legs were numb and achy. <laughs> Do you think, though, that the physical, emotional, and, and intellectual stress you were under between being in college, trying to start a business, figuring out if, if there was a market for it, who your customers were, are you going to take a corporate job and, and do what your parents want? Are you going to go in another mm -hmm. direction? That all of that leading up to your senior year caused additional stress, which led to your crash. Yes. And then you needed your second bout with um, your, your second course of IV antibiotics. Yes. Um, looking back now, I think that it was like almost a blessing in disguise because this at the time, you know, which was, you know, a, pro a school project was was actually what was getting me out of bed in the morning. And it was getting me out of those bouts of depression and made me feel like I had a purpose in a community. So that was a huge part of my healing. But on the other hand, um, which I didn't realize was just the chronic stress and that constant like fight or flight feeling. 
And, um, you know, have to remember, like, this was at a time when things like WeWork were coming out, you know, the term unicorn was coming out, like girl boss was coming out. And I think that because I already had a leadership position, um, you know, through my scholarship, and I saw my older brother and my dad be entrepreneurs. And I was like, oh, like, I, I can do this. Like, if this, if this loser can do it, I can do it, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so for me, it was just a very much blessing and a curse. Blessing because mentally, it got me out of a very dark place. But physically looking back, um, I don't ever think I allowed my body to heal. Emily, talk to us more about the stress and the fight or flight, because we know that the stress and fight or flight mode that comes along with Lyme disease is far different than anything you can experience if you don't have Lyme. So for those that are listening that are caretakers, family members, friends, et cetera, of people that are suffering from chronic Lyme, how would you describe that particular stress that comes along with Lyme disease that now has become part of life for you? Sure. And it's multifaceted and it almost gets like ingrained in your everyday life. So you don't realize that it's wrong, <laughs> you know, um, just, I think people saw me as very capable and I see myself as someone who's very capable. And from at that time, you know, the literature and from the CDC, I was like, Oh, I'll get better in six months. Like, why not? Why not do this? Because this is not going to be forever. And it took a long time. And, you know, I'm still working through that Lyme is actually a chronic condition, especially, you know, once it's reached neurological states um, and just feeling like if I don't do this, who's going to do it? So talk to us more about now you're, you're out of college, you're now building your business, and now you're on IV antibiotics again. So what was your life like at that time? And also your health, was your health improving? And how was your business developing as well? That's a great question. Um, I kind of became known as like the girl with the sock on her arm. <laughs> Previous to this, I'm sure like many patients listening, home care nurses or doctors, or even the hospital, either gives you like this Carolex gauze, which is like that mesh stretchy white gross stuff or they literally tell you to cut the toes off and wear a sock on your arm so for me that was the catalyst that was like the why um but then you know walking around for example at an accelerator like mass challenge where there's 120 companies you know of, of all backgrounds um i do think it helped me to stand out in a way like for the better because people could see i was living proof of like what I was trying to do. Um, however, it also came with like a lot of um, coaching advice that like I now don't believe. Um, at the time I was very much told like, don't tell people how sick you are, tell people this is temporary. You know, everyone thinks, you know, Lyme three weeks of doxy, you're better. So people would kind of be like, well, are you do you really have Lyme disease? Like what else is going on? And I know this was like all out of people's own lack of education but it ended up being like very hurtful to me. And I think it planted that like deep down, like pissed off, angry Lyme rage, you know, the Lyme rage started to come out even more, but that rage also like fueled the growth of the business um, and fueled me wanting to tell people my story because I knew my story was the story of millions of other people, especially young folks. And that was something that I just was like, this is ridiculous. Like, this is ridiculous that this is my life, <laughs> you know, um, because coming out of college or being in college at the time, I did have so many dreams for myself. You know, I never was able to study abroad like most of my friends and, and just those kind of little things add up. But as you're growing your business and for us, we chose to go the venture capital route because we knew, you know, we wanted to make this product, the Pick Perfect, um, an FDA approved product one day, um, which we're now in the final stages of um, doing, you know, there were there were so many pieces of advice, like people were like, oh, you should just make this a charity because you're helping people. And I'm like, that's great. But like, why, 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 you know, just because I'm a sick girl helping sick people, why is this a charity, you know, especially when there's a reimbursable code for a product like the Pick Perfect. 
Um, so it, now, you know, we've, we've grown our product line. We have the Mighty Pack, which is uh, a backpack that helps to, you know, keep all of your IV supplies um, safe and secure and like looks cool. Our Med Planner, which helped me to like organize all of my supplements and, you know, the Mighty Mask, which has just been like our, our biggest product. I think the biggest thing for us and why we, we stood out was because I was actually using all of these products in my everyday life. And I didn't intend for like my story to be the catalyst of this, but I think having a face to a story to a brand um, really helped to propel us forward in this like changing social entrepreneurship scene. Well, I have to tell you that Rich and I and my entire family are huge fans of the Mighty Mask. And I'm just kind of taking a step aside here. And I just love yesterday I was out grocery shopping and I was wearing my black Mighty Mask. And I, of course, I walk right in and what do I see? A young woman wearing a pink Mighty Mask. And, you know, you, you look at it, you're like, you're part of that community. Like you, you have an instant bond when you see that. So it really is so cool to see this community you've developed of, of complete strangers now connecting yep. because of you and your brand. So that, that's a really major accomplishment. Thank you. On that note, though, Emily, you had so many people giving you bad advice don't talk about being a chronic illness, make it a not-for-profit. And yet being so sick, you push all those horrible, horrible suggestions aside and did the right thing and built this amazing company. How did you get that strength? Where did that come from while you were still sick to avoid all of these experts giving you this bad advice? Thank you. Um, well, first having like two amazing co-founders who also went to Babson and came from family business backgrounds, you know, I was able to bounce a lot of these ideas off of them and like they would hear the same things I would hear and we would just like look at each other and just be like, no, no. Um, I do think the advice of not showing people how sick I really was, you know, was something I really had to unlearn this past year and a half because um, I can't even count how many times I was told people would not invest in me because I was chronically ill or had a medical device. Um, so, I think for us, you know, fundraising and just putting yourself out there and it really feels like selling yourself. Um, you know, it's, it's been great because I've educated so many people and the people that have joined mighty well, um, they instantly get it because they are a part of this community. But unfortunately, there's still so many people out there who, who really have never worked with people who are chronically ill disabled and they don't see that you know, if you become passionate about something, this is your why, this is why you're getting up every day, despite the migraines, the, you know, you're, you're walking to the subway to catch that meeting, be, even though your legs numb, because you just so believe that it could be better. Um, and I think that's where the tenacity came from, just knowing that, you know, this was, the, this was unacceptable. So I have another sort of side question for you that I think is sure. a really important question we've been exploring with a lot of our guests lately. You just sort of intuitively had this drive to get better. You, mm -hmm. you went and you treated, it wasn't working. And then you followed up and you did, it, you did additional IV treatment. And then you, you got better and you started, you had a little bit of a setback and you went back and you treated again. And then you were using Chinese medicine. Many people go, possibly get one treatment, doesn't work, they stop and they stay stuck and they stay there for years. What do you think gave you the drive and the motivation to continue to fight this battle, not knowing what's going to work, how long it's going to work for, and continue to push forward? Do you think it was that purpose you had to help other people, mm -hmm. and that gave you the push forward that you needed to not get stuck and just give up? Sure. That's a really heavy question, um, and I think that's a huge part of it, knowing that like how many people were coming to me, whether that was publicly or privately. Um, of all walks of life from many different countries that I knew there was something here. Um, I am definitely a very intuitive person. I, I identify as claircognizant. So I, I saw that this was going to happen. I, you know, five, seven years ago, adaptive fashion was not even on a category. It's not even on anyone's radar. And I, I somehow intuitively saw that. Um, so knowing that it was going to happen I think was a huge driving factor um, behind that tenacity and and both my parents they they are fighters like they do not give up like no is not an acceptable answer so I think you know my mom really being a cheerleader um, and saying like you you can't stop fighting was a huge piece of it um, and lastly like remembering my childhood as healthy I think 
my, my age period was very unique in that I have a lot of memories of me doing very active things. So knowing that, um, basically like I refused that this was going to be my life, you know, I, and I'm coming to the point where, you know, I, I now identify as disabled and chronically ill, but I, I still have hope. And I still have dreams that are yet to be dreamed. And, and that's what keeps me going. But Emily, would you agree that although Lyme is a chronic illness, meaning it's something you'll mm-hmm. have to address your entire life, and I've accepted that, that mm-hmm. you can reach a symptom-free state and with a healthy lifestyle, stay there and then have to manage your stress levels with the understanding that you may have setbacks, you may have flare-ups, yes. and that you can though have a great quality of life if you keep fighting and doing the right things in your journey. Is that something that you believe? I absolutely believe that. And I now have friends, you know, who are, who call themselves, you know, like um, pretty much better. I don't really think there's a cure, um, at this point in time. Um, but I honestly, until the pandemic did not realize how big of like stress played a factor into my health and now, um, really protecting that kind of like sacred time in my schedule, um, for healing and integration of the therapies I'm doing is something I was not doing a few years ago. So we're going to jump to that a little bit later. I do want to go back. So now you're, you're building your business, you're seeking venture capitalist money and you're treating mm-hmm. with antibiotics. Was your health improving at this time? In addition to all the stress that you had to build your business? It is so hard to say, Matt. I would say that it kept me at baseline and it kept me going. I do not think it, um, it didn't get me to remission levels. Um, you know, I'm now uh, seeing Dr. Kelly from Case Health and she just redid all of my genetics and uh, labs and, and Infecto and all that. And I'm, I'm actually really proud to say that um, she told me my Lyme and co-infections were at remission levels. So that to me was, I almost like didn't believe her because I was like, what? Like, <laughs> You know, I've been fighting this now for what feels like forever. Um, And just learning that, you know, stress management and mental health were kind of the two pieces that I was missing beforehand. You know, like I was going to a psychologist every two weeks, but honestly, she didn't believe in Lyme and I I had to fire her. (laughs) So, um, you know, I I actually had a, I'm just starting to tell people, but I I had a really, really big relapse um, in February of 2019. And I'm just starting to come out of that. Um, I really believe that, um, my husband and I came in contact with COVID when we were living in New York city by all the hospitals, he came back from an international trip and he was, so he was like flat out sick for like four or five days. I was as well, but you know, we, we didn't even get tested then by the time, you know, we could get the whatever the PC, the, the test to look, if it's in your system, like it it had already been well over six months. So, so one, I don't know if I got COVID, but the timing and the placing and the symptoms did match up. Um, I was at the point, you know, where again, I felt like back when I was 19, like not being able to get out of bed, not knowing what was wrong with me, the brain fog being so bad, the joint pain increasing light sensitivity. Um, last summer, I also found seven ticks, you know, in the town I grew up in. So was I bit again? I don't know. Um, but I, I've had a very difficult 18 months. Um, I did not feel like going back to IV antibiotics was the answer at the time. Um, and I feel like I'm now at a point where I want to start talking about it and letting people know that um, just how challenging the last 18 months were for me through this journey. And that was early 2020, I think, uh, last year that you had this sickness that you believe to be COVID, right? Which probably very likely was COVID. Right, right. But you know what the funny thing is, Matt? Like I've told friends who are not in the Lyme community that like I had all these symptoms and these things happened in in February of 2020. And they actually like, they're like, well, you didn't have a test. Like you don't know if that's true. And I'm like, I don't, but the time, so like they still don't believe me. So I'm just learning that like people like you are my true community. And it doesn't matter if they didn't believe me because, you know, they weren't they weren't bedridden like I was. I do want to address, because you said something really powerful, that beyond treating, the two things you were missing, I think you said were stress management, and was it mental health? Was that the other piece of it? Yes, 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 yes. You know, 
just, I didn't know. I didn't know. So let, I just want to back up just a little bit. So from the time period of post-college up until 2020, early 2020, when you got sick again with COVID, which probably triggered a, a relapse of your other possibly Epstein-Barr and other things in, in yes, your body yes. from being weakened. Did anything else happen in, in between that time period that, that was noteworthy in your health journey, you know, as far as any additional treatments, therapies, things you did from a detox standpoint, a yes. drainage standpoint, um, anything that you want to you share with our listeners? Yes, I am very fortunate that I got approved pretty quickly for IVIG. Um, for your listeners who aren't familiar with that, um, it's IV gamma globulin. They essentially take uh, each vial has about a thousand blood donors, which they pool um, together. They clean the blood and they pull out gamma globulin, which is which is like the immune system part of each blood cell. Um, so for, for the past five years, I've been going through that therapy. And that is something, again, that I felt like allowed me to sustain this very active and kind of crazy lifestyle I was living for five years. So do you think from the time you graduated college up until really when you got sick with COVID, you were just treating and doing IV antibiotics and then IVIG, and it was really just keeping you at a base level to function, but yes. you weren't really, quote unquote, healthy, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when did you learn about stress management and mental health? And give us examples of things that you're now doing to address those two areas beyond just treating the Lyme disease. Sure. Um, so, you know, with, with walk down, my husband and I left um, our apartment on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. Um, and we just, you know, never went back. And we quarantined at my parents' house in Rhode Island for about eight months before moving up to Providence. And it was in that time period of isolation that um, I think because I didn't have all of the like running around, you know, physically in my life, like I wasn't like walking to the subway anymore. I wasn't catching a flight, you know, to Utah to see a client um, that I was able to like slow down and listen to my body. And I was able to, um, I am so, so thankful that while I was living in New York, I found a Lyme literate um, mental health um, professional. Her name's Rochelle, um, who she herself had Lyme. So she was really able to kind of walk me through things like internal family systems, like, you know, the emotion wheel, you know, journaling. I got back into journaling. I got back into doing art and all of the time just being quiet forced me to listen to my body. You know, I started meditating. Um, you know, I started just spending alone time at the beach again. And it was at those time periods where a lot of memories came flooding back to me, you know, like being a bit at six years old and, and just starting to realize that, Ooh, you know, the stress management part, was not being addressed. And I, I do look at, you know, COVID um, being a blessing in disguise for me in, in those regards. So, so yeah, just really thankful to have a Lyme literate psychologist. I think that was the first check the box. Emily, a lot of people get upset when they hear you should see a Lyme literate therapist or a therapist to go along with treating Lyme disease because they always, they always get, and rightfully so, defensive and say, it's not in my head. I have a real physical illness. And although that's true, that Lyme is a mm -hmm. real physical illness, talk to us about why you think it's important to address the mental health component, which is a byproduct or a consequence of having Lyme disease that needs to be addressed. Because many people don't want to accept that because of the trauma they faced by being told sure. they're crazy and it's all in their head. Right. And of course, I was told it was all in my head. Um, for me, I was having very real symptoms of profound anxiety um, and profound depression. In these kind of, uh, I didn't let people see that, but it was really affecting me in private. Um, but I think for others, like, and especially generationally, there's a lot of stigma with mental health. Um, I'm definitely the first person in my family to even talk about these things. Um, so I can understand why people are like, ah, I'm not crazy, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think especially people who have seen multiple doctors and been in and out of the hospital, there's a lot of medical trauma. So first and foremost, like most people aren't, aren't recognizing the, the trauma that they face just by going through the U.S. medical system. Um, so for me, that's definitely number one. Um, secondly, I, I now know um, I became a Reiki practitioner in the past year and a half of, of just learning how 
you know, there can be stuck energy in the body. And if you don't complete, you know, kind of the trauma response, that emotions do get stuck. And I do think that prevents um, our healing journey. You know, if, if we are not, you know, if our heart is heavy, you know, how can we compassionately take care of ourselves through all of this? Emily, all these techniques that you've mentioned, have they helped you heal, do you believe, physically as well? Yes. I do not think I would have come out of these last 18 months um, if, if it was not for this radical mental health approach that I've taken. Um, I've included things like Reiki, like sound healing, working with a somatic um, coach, working with an integration coach, um, you know, to do all these things, find, you know, in, in as simple as like unfollowing unhealthy accounts on Instagram, like how, or logging, deleting the app on my phone for a week, you know, it's, it's those little steps, um, you know, and I'm very fortunate where um, my family's able to invest in, you know, some of these alternative protocols, but so many of these can be learned online for free. And, you know, if I had someone, you know, like an integration coach four or five years ago, I, I just really don't know how much better it would have been for me. So for those that are listening that are wanting to speak with a therapist who understands Lyme, because we hear that often also, mm -hmm. I went to therapy, they don't believe in chronic Lyme, they think that I'm just really mentally ill and don't understand chronic Lyme, and then they don't get any benefit from that therapist. Mm -hmm. So there aren't many that we know of, and the ones that we are aware of are, are not seeing the patients, unfortunately, but is your Lyme literate therapist who had Lyme disease herself, is she seeing mm -hmm. new patients? And if so, can people DM you to, to possibly get that contact information to seek maybe virtual assistance, you know, if they're through, you know, anywhere around the world or even the country for that matter? Yes. Um, her name is Rochelle Kana. Um, I think I'm pronouncing her last name right. Um, I believe she has seen new patients. And one of the best things is she actually does a free Lyme support group every Thursday at 7 p.m. So please DM me for her information. Um, you know, she's out of pocket, of course, but does have some accessible options for people. Um, and I think where you can, you know, going to virtual support groups is helpful. There's a lot of free integration circles that you can find through meetup.com. Um, and I know there's some amazing young women, um, you know, doing, doing things where like, they're just getting together for coffee on the side. So like, even if you can't find someone or afford someone who's a Lyme literate, you know, mental health practitioner, I think there actually now are a lot of um, accessible kind of groups and meetups that people can join. Just to add to that, the San Diego Lyme Association has a meetup every month with a trained therapist who had who has chronic Lyme and runs that group as well. So now we just learned of another one with your therapist who had Lyme disease and runs a free Lyme support group virtually. So now we know of two, yeah. which are free resources that people can take advantage of, that people can take advantage of in the Lyme community that are looking for some sort of mental health assistance. Mm -hmm. I do want to ask though, so when you got sick with COVID last year, what did you do to address your physical symptoms? Did you, I know you mentioned you were thinking about IV antibiotics. Were you still taking mm -hmm. the Chinese medicine? Were you doing anything else to combat all the physical reactivations that occurred from the COVID? Sure. Um, and I'll say what I believe to be COVID. You know, I have no way of confirming that. Well, I'm, um, I'm, I'm just going to say definitely it's COVID. It's okay. You don't have to. I will. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for validating me, Matt. You know, I think that's part of it too. Like, can I yeah. even trust myself that like, this is what I had? That, that still is definitely with me. Um, but throughout this time period, um, you know, moving back from New York City, um, I decided to go to a functional and integrative health clinic, the Lyme and Pan Center on uh, Cape Cod. Um, so yeah, I, I started driving about an hour, hour and a half. Actually, I couldn't drive anymore. I hired a friend to drive me once a week. Um, and I started doing things like IV vitamin C, IV ALA, moving to a very supplement heavy protocol in that I would say, you know, doing those IVs, um, you know, through my port were very helpful in that I didn't feel like I needed to go back on IV antibiotics. And I also felt like my symptoms were more on the Epstein-Barr virus side, which we later confirmed because I was just, 
I was a hot freaking mess. <laughs> um, and, you know, we were able to redo all of my testing and figuring out, you know, okay, my Babesia is still active, but my Lyme is, you know, at lower levels. So it was really just going back to like, really the whiteboard and saying, you know, what testing can, I, I basically redid all of my testing. We found out I had some autoimmune issues. We found out, you know, I had celiac. Um, I had to redo PET MRIs, tilt table tests. And, you know, unfortunately over the past year and a half, I've, I've done those every six months. There was about a, a 12 month period where the labs just kept getting worse. And we were like, this is something, something, something's going on here. But I did find that once um, I had, you know, that treatment plan um, up and running, I was, I really spent the past 18 months laser focused on my mental health and allowing some of those very painful traumatic memories, both, you know, from childhood and through the medical system to let those go. And just allowing me to feel a little bit lighter has, I think, created more space in my body for healing to occur. Emily, what you're saying is not surprising because over the past month, we've seen a ton of articles in the media about long COVID being caused by reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. And now mm. you're saying that, right? Your Epstein-Barr went off the charts after you had- Off what the you freaking charts. May or may not have been, it was COVID. So here you are with now the same symptoms that people of long COVID had, right? So mm. it just, I think is consistent with the studies that we're finding now. And I do just want to back up one second and, and ask you, you mentioned that you, did, you, you were doing IV vitamins and supplements and a lot of other things mm. for the last 18 months, but you also mentioned IV ALA. Can you describe for us? I, I don't even know what is ALA. Sure. ALA, which I had never heard of before, is alpha lipoic acid. Um, it can be taken over like in a supplement form. So it is accessible for people or through an IV form, which we found that my body, I have the MFTR gene, you know, it just uh, it needed to go into the body that way. Um, it's been studied to help with diabetic nerve pain. I would say for the past 18 months, my nerve pain has been off the chart to the point where typing is very difficult. Driving is very difficult. At times I do need a cane. Um, thankfully that's becoming a little bit less and less. Um, but alpha lipoic acid has actually helped me to get off gabapentin, which I'd been on for five years. So um, that is something that I hope more Lyme patients look into. Well, that's amazing. And thank you for sharing that because I think that's a very common symptom, nerve pain, neuropathy. And if mm. there's something that's one help, of my top three, that's, mm. that's amazing. So talk to us about Dr. Casey Kelly. Have you been working with her since you had COVID or has it been more recently that you've been starting to treat with Dr. Kelly? Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, going through these past 18 months, I, um, you know, made great progress at the Lyme and Pan Center, but I wanted to see someone who, understood some of the autoimmune challenges as well. Um, and a good friend of mine um, was being treated by her and I had listened to a number of her interviews, podcasts, and I actually listened to her episode with you right before I went to go see her in May. And I was just so impressed about um, the amount of time she spent with me, the compassion she had, the amazing job of doing every test that she had access to for me and you know that's cost that's time that's uh, like the waiting period can kind of mess with your brain but i would say um you know it was well worth traveling to chicago um to see her now doing you know remote treatments and um as she mentioned in the podcast with you previously i'm on a very heavy herbal antibiotic regimen which um, I felt was actually like more intense than the Chinese herbal protocol that I did uh, quite a few years back. And she's given me hope again. And I think a large part of that is because she's looking at the 360 of the patient and what else, what other damage did Lyme cause, you know? And, and for me, that's been a lot of autoimmune challenges and neurological challenges. So give us an assessment. If you had to say, I know you're still battling this and look, I know, and I know Rich knows you're going to get into remission and you're going to just continue to kick ass and just change the world like you already have, Emily. I mean, you're just, mm -hmm. you're such an inspiration that we've really enjoyed this interview so far already, but give us an idea. Where's your health now? And yeah. what do you, what are what are your plans for the future as far as treatments and also with Mighty Well? Sure. Thank you for asking. Um, so as I mentioned, the past 18 months have been a very dark place for me physically and mentally. Um, but 
through the help of legal psychedelic therapy, it actually changed my life. Um, and I do want to tell people this because it's accessible now in many states. And it was just able to help me um, lift the depression and the anxiety. And that allowed me to refocus and have hope again that this was possible. Um, so through legal, um, uh, legal medicine, ketamine therapy, that um, was, I, I honestly credit it for saving my life. I'm, I'm that serious about it. Um, my depression, my Lyme rage was just at an all time high. And I was like, I was having out of body experiences again, Matt, and not the psychedelic kind, the, the, the Lyme brain fog kind, and just kind of looking at myself in the mirror being like, is this really it? Um, you know, suicidal thoughts were coming in that were not my thoughts, but they were present. Um, so I, I feel really lucky that I, I've found plant medicine and I've found this, you know, emerging um, care plan. And the reason I do want to be open and tell people about this is because if I had access to these therapies 10 years ago, I think I could have saved myself a lot of physical and mental pain. And um, I really do believe it's the future of healthcare. We already have people like the Cohen Foundation who are investing in this research at John Hopkins. And I do think it's going to be a dramatic shift in the way that chronic illness and things like medical PTSD um, are being treated. So, so that's why I wanna be open with that. Um, Billy, I've also been, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I just, I just wanna thank you for being so honest because you know, we all can relate to what you just described, but not many people are willing to be as raw and vulnerable as you just were. So thank you, because I know the majority of the people listening to this podcast have been there, and this is going to be so helpful for them to hear you sharing this and that you've been able to get help and feel better from these emotional and psychological thoughts that you've had. So thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you, Matt. You know, I, I've debated a lot with, with do I tell people and, it's, and I just go back to, you know, why did I tell people about a pick line and Lyme disease? Because I didn't want people to go through what I went through. Um, you know, I, I haven't even told a lot of my family members, but they've definitely seen the changes in me. And I will say that, um, you know, going through uh, legal psychedelic therapy is, you know, a huge part of why I've been able to get back to work again. And, and has reinvigorated my belief and passion in, you know, our medical wearables um, as a category, as, you know, patients at the forefront of th these changes we need to see in the healthcare industry. Um, and I just wish that more people had access to these life-saving medicines. So I do want to break it down a little bit more with you before Rich takes over again. When you mentioned the psychedelic therapies, what exactly do you mean by this? Is this because you mentioned ketamine? Is are the psychedelic therapies different than ketamine, or are they one of the same? Can you can you go into a little bit more detail for us about sure. that? Because I think a lot of our listeners are going to be interested and want to learn about that for their own journeys. Sure, and I'm I'm purely speaking as like Emily Levy, the person, the patient, not yes. Emily Levy from Mighty Well. So I do want to separate that. Um, Yes, I uh, ketamine therapy um, for primarily PTSD is legal, I think in about 20 states now, New York and Florida um, being two of you know the biggest place in California, of course, like to adopt this. Um, but essentially you work with a therapist and um, for me, I was shown a lot of things that I just didn't know were hurting me for so long and were really energetic blocks preventing me from, from fully getting better. And some of those are realizations like I needing to prioritize my health, you know, and, and slow down and, and be more um, selective with opportunities that I agree to do. Um, but, you know, and then putting on my mighty well hat, you know, it's allowed me to being, um, just really in touch with what our community needs and in being able to now in my new role as chief brand officer, really connecting again with our patients and our communities, not only to provide, you know, medical wearables that they need, but how, what kind of community and support do they need? Um, and, and to further answer your question, just to kind of like what it looks like is um, essentially there are a number of, um, legal clinics, you know, that you go to, you're given the medicine with the supervision of a nurse practitioner or a doctor, 
um, at least with ketamine, it lasts about 40, 45 minutes. And then you take time with the therapist. Um, this is a separate therapist, a my Lyme literate one. Um, you know, you, you can dive deeper into, into the healing, into the integration, um, into the, the why, you know, why is my body not letting me get better? Oh yeah, it's because I have that traumatic memory from the first time that I was sent to the emergency room. So what's really interesting here, Emily, is we, we've been identifying patterns out of our almost 200 podcast episodes. And we've heard a lot about ketamine and we've heard mm -hmm. people say it's been very helpful and other people say it hasn't been so helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think you're helping us identify a pattern regarding timing. So the people mm -hmm. that tried ketamine therapy before a diagnosis or earlier on to treat their symptoms, they didn't have success because they didn't treat their Lyme disease. They didn't treat their, their condition yet. But those like you who are doing it at the latter part of the healing journey are having great success. So do you think that this yes. is something that should be considered in a timing or a sequential order that it really should be done after treatment and not either in parallel or before treatment? That's a great question, Matt. And I, I really do think it's up to the medical team who's like in charge of this patient because all of us are so unique. Um, I don't, I don't think like mentally I would have been ready for these type, this type of healing unless I was at another level of rock bottom. So I think that's really to be considered and it's almost, to me, it's, it's, um, it's almost like a last resort medication. Um, you know, this psychedelics definitely open up your whole world and thought frame and someone who's in a very fragile state, I'm not sure that's the best route for them at that point in time. You know, for me, I was just at the point where I was like, if I don't, if, if I don't try this, I, I can't say, you know, I hate to say it, but like I, I was suicidal. But I mean, I think you're saying that you have to be ready for it. And if you're not yeah. accepting of it, it may not actually help you. And you were in a place where you were willing and accepting of this particular particular treatment in helping yeah. you. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Um, like the first kind of mantra I was taught was like, trust, let go and be open. I think that so many Lyme and chronically ill patients have very difficulty trusting, letting go and being open because we're told it's all in our head or you know we're dismissed so many times. But I think if you can get to a place where you're ready to trust again, um, and you're ready to be open um, with your experiences, I think that's the only way you can truly heal. So Emily, let's talk a little bit more about ketamine and plant medicines and sure. the purpose as you understand it. Because what I'm trying to get a handle on is whether or not these plant medicines um, and the psychedelics are assisting with the, um, the resolving of unhealthy brain pathways that have developed mm. in an Ill, Ill person? Or is it a tool to assist with essentially cleansing the, um, the psychological issues that have developed? Because I, I'm not really clear on the difference between the two. Sure. Um, and I can break it down the best way kind of I see. Um, for me, it's really helped to break down those negative thought patterns and also to not have some of those like agoraphobia reactions to things. You know, it allowed me to be able to trust that a new treatment and protocol was going to work. It trusted me to, it allowed me to help trust that like, you know, there was hope again. Um, but I think it's, it's really hard to say, and it really depends on what plant medicine you're using. You know, I'm right. speaking about my experience with ketamine and that allowed me to get off of SSRIs because it almost like replaced that, but it's almost like, oh, instead of this SSRI making me feel like crap and gain weight and, you know, all these other side effects, oh, this is something I can take once every two weeks for about an eight week period. And then I can, you know, integrate that. And if I need to do it again, I can. So for me, it allowed one less medication to be in my system. And it allowed, I guess, the breaking down of those mental barriers and walls to be more tolerable. So Emily, when Matt and I have been debating about this, when looking at the patterns, we're, we're sort of looking at the physiological versus the emotional challenges that people suffering from chronic illness are facing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, physiologically, you may continue to have pain signals coming to you, 
even though you are in remission. So in your case, Dr. Kelly um, put you through a battery of tests, which have indicated that your Lyme and co-infections were no longer causing pain signals, yet you are continuing to receive the pain signal. So is it possible that what was happening was your brain was stuck in a, in a pain loop and continued to send the pain signals, even though the bacteria, the viruses, and the, uh, and the protozoa that were in your system were no longer actually in your system causing the pain signal? Sure, that's, that's a real possibility. You know, I do know I had other um, non-tick-borne illness viruses and bacteria is active, so it's hard to say, you know, one versus the other. Um, but I do think like the brain, as we said, like gets in that fight or flight system and, you know, every little thing, especially with COVID, you know, seems scary. Like if I don't see someone with a mask or, you know, my brain starts to, to freak out. Um, and that's, you know, a learned pattern and just being able to give a little bit of space to that, um, I think is, is what these medicines have allowed for me. Right. So the, so the question that Matt was asking you, and, and, and part of this is triggered by a conversation that we had with Dorothy Leland from LymeDisease.org. And one of the things mm -hmm. that she shared with us um, when interviewing her about her book, Parenting uh, a Child with Lyme, is that her daughter was not able to fully heal until she went through the process of retraining her brain, right? Yes. And, and, um, and after she went through the brain retraining process, then she finally was in remission. And she suggested that it was necessary for that to be done after she had completed the earlier portion of our journey. And I think what Matt was asking you is the same thing, which was, do you think that you really needed to get through this process of, of getting your, um, your disease into remission so that you can then identify the need to use plant medicines or some form of, of, a, of a psychedelic to help you to now go through the neuro retraining mm -hmm. so that you wouldn't be symptomatic without the, uh, without the um, diseases or the germs causing the injury. Sure. And, and I think that's a really... Um, great point that she made about her daughter. And, you know, for me, it's just, it's really hard to say, like part of it, knowing how much mental pain I was in, you know, since 15, 16 years old, if there had been these type of interventions, um, you know, I think that could have helped a lot, but at the same time, it's the pattern work that you're, I think you're referring to of retraining your brain that I am now able to do because, I think first step is you just got to fight the infection. You know, it, like you were talking about earlier, like you, you can't be doing like a million things at once because your body doesn't really know how to respond and, and what to take in. And you, you only have so much energy. You know, I think that's the biggest piece of it. Um, so I'm now at the point where um, for me, I do feel like really diving into this route would only be possible if after doing such heavy treatments. However, that is not to say these therapies drastically could have helped me when I was ha in extreme mental pain as a young, young adult and child. Well, so, but I also think, Emily, we don't really have a clear vocabulary, at least in the Lyme communities that we're losing to distinguish the fight or flight response, which is a response to an attack, right? Your body is defending itself from an attack and our body doesn't distinguish a lion from a social attack from a bacterial attack, right? We're in fight or flight. So that's one type of, uh, of emotional response, which we could get caught up into. But another type of emotional response could be from the medical trauma. Another type of response could be the pain response that that's being triggered by the bacteria that's attacking our body. So we, we have to come up with a vocabulary to distinguish these different types of emotional responses mm -hmm. so that we can come up with a solution that will address the specific response. Because plant medicine may or may not be helpful at a particular phase in your, in your journey because we're calling everything a mental response right mm -hmm. and 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 that's part of what we're trying to explore here is how do we distinguish fight or flight from depression from neurological signals of pain that you're that you're ill to pre-existing events that are now making you susceptible to being um uh, you know un unable to heal so there are just so many 
you know, different ways of defining this whole thing. And of course, then we have this, this, um, this knee jerk response, which is understandable when you're being told it's in your head that you're saying now it's not in my head. So we, you know, we have this real difficult challenge that I think we have to overcome part of it, even coming up with a vocabulary to distinguish the different types of mental health issues that would be appropriate for different types of intervention. For sure. And, and to your point, like as a patient who's been going through this for years, I did not know that. And I think that's so important of like why we're talking about this um, as someone who, you know, is actively sharing my mental health journey, you know, through social media. I didn't even know about this. So I, I think what's going to be key, especially in the next, you know, say 10 years of Lyme research is this factor of how does mental health and, and you know, all of these different crazy stimuluses that we're taking in and how can we address those properly with the right treatment plans. Um, that is something I feel very passionately about going forward. And I am so glad to see that so many of the big Lyme research foundations and um, hospitals like, like John Hopkins are now looking into this for chronically ill patients. I believe this is the future. So really now let's pivot to the beauty of this journey and let's, let's, let's focus on um, what you learned about yourself that you would not have been able to learn, but for the suffering that you've gone through and how that has put you in a position where you've learned what gifts God has given you and how you've used those gifts, not just to heal yourself, but to create a company that's healing other people. Just to hear you say that, like, gets me emotional because I, I do go back to all those moments in my dorm room where, you know, Maria and I would be like rushing in between class to like send out one pick line cover to like one person who dm'd us you know and just to see that you know we've doubled growth every year since our, our foundation um and just how many new people you know have joined the community is for me the biggest like bright light through all of this um and just seeing that it, it almost validates that it wasn't all in my head you know i don't i can't even tell you how many people told me that like why, why did disabled people need special clothing or like why, you know, I would go to all these medical, oh, let me just tell you this one story, Rich. I went to a vascular access conference with my pick line. This is at, um, on my second pick line. So it's like 22, 23. And one of the like medical device booth vendors looked at my pick and was like, did you get that placed for this conference? And I was like, I'm going to swear what the actual fuck? Like, <laughs> you know, like, so, so those are the kind of like everyday questions. I remember I had another like part-time job teaching entrepreneurship and like other professors, like staring at me from across the cafeteria, talking about the drugs going into my arm, you know? And, and so, so all of those things, you know, are deep seated traumas that I've been learning to undo. But the brightness out of it is is the community that's been formed and actually the way that Mighty Well is helping to shift an industry like vascular access. You know, we created a product out of our dorm rooms that I needed just to keep my line safe. Meanwhile, these billion dollar, you know, medical device companies didn't even think that like, OK, a patient has to shower, a patient has to hold their kids, a patient has to, you know, go grocery shopping and they've got a foot of tubing hanging out. From them so so just seeing now how these big medical device companies have wanted to work with mighty well gives me real hope that we're actually changing an industry um but i'm always going to come back to the stories and the the photos that get shared with us you know absolutely that is my why that is why i get out of bed you know that is what allowed me to want to fight so hard these past 18 months because i was like i have to get back to my community like i need them they need me you know there are so many more medical wearables that need to be created by just sitting for hours and hours at the iv clinic this past year just more products that i know are needed you know more conversations like mental health and chronic illness that need to be started and i just feel like you know, this is really a part of God's plan for me and that my illness is actually a catalyst for social change, social entrepreneurship, and, you know, for turning sickness into strength, which is my motto in life. So now let's talk about this on the micro level. You mm -hmm. have now uh, pivoted from being the CEO 
to another position. And mm -hmm. that's in part being driven by your illness and the, uh, and the reactivation of your illness. So talk to us about how initially that was painful for you to come to that position, but how you ultimately came to see now that that's really part of your calling. And as much as you try to resist what you're called to do, Emily finds herself going where it is that she's driven. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, to your point, a lot of that was initially driven out of my my health challenges um, starting last year and just knowing, you know, that I couldn't be running around. I couldn't be flying across the country. I couldn't be looking at a screen or typing. Um, so that was very hard for me to come to terms with. Um, but it was really since, you know, the last three or four months that I've been able to, you know, start to um, be open with what I've been going through and just realizing that my true calling is to use my story for social change. And, you know, with the energy levels I do have, because I am still in very heavy treatment, um, where can I use my my energy and my voice best? And we found that for Mighty Well, that's in a role as a chief brand officer. So for, for those who aren't familiar, Chief Brands Officer's real responsibility, you know, is connecting with the community and seeing what our community needs in order for our brand to grow. And it's doing, you know, fun things like this podcast, it's doing fun things like uh, helping to design new products. And, you know, we're coming up on our five-year official anniversary and just figuring out, you know, thank you. You know, what is the next evolution of Mighty Well, especially after um, how much COVID has changed our healthcare system? And I think a blessing in disguise through all of this is that um, things like chronic illness and, um, you know, this long COVID, which we're still learning what it is, you know, that conversation has been brought to the forefront. And as the chief brand officer, I want to make sure people know that there are actual patients who are trying to shape and change this conversation. Um, and, and if you don't include the patient, you know, that's actually bad for a healthcare company's bottom line. So Emily, there is a difference between being an entrepreneur and being a CEO. And yeah. there is a difference between R&D, which is really what you've always been. You've always been the chief research and development person in this and the chief, chief research and development spirit of this company and when you got away from that and you became the ceo look what happened you got called right back to where you always had been and you got called right back to where your gifts and talents are best used so yeah. i think this is a an awesome quite frankly um shift for you personally for your company and for all of us who consider ourselves part of the mighty well community thank you you know i consider you both friends in the fight which is what we call our community um because i just have that mentality of like you can never stop fighting whether that's for social justice whether that's for your health or whether that's just you know a change in your own family or community so i'm excited for this new new role you know as the ceo previously i did a lot of time looking at spreadsheets at computers at flying all over the world and just my body can't do that right now um and, and i'll leave it with you know there was a big shift in me for i, I identified as chronically sick and chronically ill, but I actually didn't really identify as disabled. And I think that's because a lot of the things um, society told me about like what a disabled person looked like. And once I started to need a cane again, well, I need a cane for the first time, but you know, another physical medical device or having my port accessed, you know, seven days in a row and people seeing that like, you know, something's wrong with this girl, <laughs> you know, um, people's people have been more compassionate to me. So I do want to encourage all of your listeners that like medical devices are not a shameful thing. Um, you know, they're as much for you sometimes as they are for other people. And, you know, if, if your legs don't work, you know, go to pattyandricky.com and order yourself a cane. That's like exactly what I did, you know, go, go figure out what, you know, you can put on your body to, make you feel a little bit better for me like doing my hair and makeup and dressing up has always helped me um you know to have that boost for a day so so whatever it is for you that gives you that boost um embrace it 
let's talk about the last thing we talk about on uh, the Thick Bootcamp podcast. Um, so let's first introduce your husband to our audience. We, we have this fellow who you met in, in college who you offered an opportunity to run out as fast as he could and he decided he was yeah. gonna stay then and he's been your greatest supporter ever since. So let's first introduce him to, your, to our community. What is your husband's name and, uh, and how long have you and he been married? Sure, uh, his name is Yusuf Alhumadi. Um, he was born and raised in Kuwait, and uh, he came to Babson College, um, which is where Maria, you know, where we also met her. Um, you know, he really helped me with the first prototype in design, um, like in our dorm rooms, went to those like initial opportunities on campus. Um, so he's a very entrepreneurial person. Um, in terms of our business skill sets, he really likes to be in the back office with the door closed looking at Excel. And if you made me do that, I think like, oh, uh, no, no, just no. You need um, another ketamine you know, treatment. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, I can talk to anyone. I, I'll stand up in front of 500 people. You know, that's not even scary for me. Um, so our skills really complement each other. And um, right now he's actually getting his MBA at MIT where he got a full scholarship. So I'm really excited to now tap into some of those technologies um, coming out of MIT and expand our network, you know, further in Boston. Um, but his job is he's our co-founder and CFO. So, you know, he does all the stuff I hate to do. <laughs> and I guess I do all the things he hates to do. Um, and, and I do have to include our other co-founder, Maria Delmar Gomez. Uh, she's originally from the Dominican Republic met at college um but again she was the person who was helping me shower she was going both of them were going through these lived experiences with me and as much as my family was there for me maria and yusuf were the ones that were there for me on an everyday constant basis you know marie even let me like crash at her house for six months you know rent free because i just you know uh, all my money was going to my drugs my real drugs you know these IV antibiotics so so both of them um you know just mighty well would not be possible without them and i'm just incredibly grateful how much they stepped up um when my health was you know at a low point and just how open with communication both of them have been you know thankfully both of them are healthy in the grand scheme of things you know we all deal with our own you know challenges mental health wise but they are healthy compared to me and i think it's really critical to point out that um mighty well would not be possible without the two of them so let's talk about yousef and uh and um maria the end of this podcast he comes walking into the room uh emily and uh he had been out in the yard and he came inside and he found a large tick biting him on his leg what would you recommend that he do so he wouldn't have to leave his healthy state and become a chronically ill warrior like you? Well, first I would yell at him if he had on tick spray. <laughs> um, and then from there, you know, I, um, I don't know if y'all have inter uh, interviewed tick man Dan yet, but I love his tick removal tool. So I keep those on hand. So I, you know, I know how to remove a tick, but most people don't. I'd recommend them go look on YouTube. Um, but I would save the tick, I put it in a plastic bag, do not flush it down the toilet, you know, maybe you burn it, you know, if you don't have access to sending it in, but I would send it into a lab, you know, I know UMass does pretty affordable testing. That's something I wish I knew about years ago. Um, and then, you know, I would make an, an appointment with the Lyme literate doctor or nurse practitioner immediately and, you know, run the hygienics testing, run all the lab work, take those vials of blood, and I would be there holding his hand just like he held mine or, um, you know, holding my hair back, holding, he's bald, but you know, he would hold my hair back when I'd puke. <laughs> so, so whatever he would need, I, I would do back for him. Thank you for listening to the Tick Bootcamp interview with our guest, Emily Levy. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Emily Levy, please visit our Instagram page at mightywell underscore Emily. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Take Bootcamp podcast, please share it with your friends by using the social media buttons you see at the bottom of our post. Third, Take Bootcamp has created a Take Bite blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at www.takebootcamp.com to view the blueprint. Please note we would appreciate any input or any improvements you'd like to share with us.
4th. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play Music, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. And finally, we thank you, our community, for your comments on our past podcast episodes. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on iTunes, on Instagram, or on our website. We make it a point to read every single one of the reviews we get. Thank you, as always, for listening.